Hi, and welcome back to the lighthouse. We're about to beam up into the sustainability constellation. Today is the last day with input talks in the questions fair. So this is going to be the last time we make it out into the sustainability constellation to discuss the questions that are going to be research questions for YSI going forward. Um, if you're out there watching on the stream, watching on Facebook Live, watching on YouTube, now come onto the YSI Plenary platform, ysiplenary.org. Click the night sky in the background, go into the sustainability constellation. Let's come together for one last time to try to find the questions that will be up in this constellation for other people to favorite. Uh, you might have noticed that over the last couple of days over the YSI Plenary, we've been talking a lot about pertinent questions. And the choice of this word pertinent is actually something that was discussed quite a lot before we uh, agreed on this uh, uh, exercise because uh, we were also tending at one po point towards inspiring the 100 most inspiring questions and uh, some people have consistently called it the 100 most important questions. And uh, the reason that we're going with pertinent is because we want the questions to be like we, we want YSI to be a community where you can explore your own curiosity. We want all kinds of curiosities to find their way here. So therefore we don't want the questions to be restrictive, but to be opening new pathways for research. And if we had gone with important, well, there would have been a very valid argument out there to say, well, if we're looking for the 100 most important questions, then all the questions should be in the sustainability constellation because Climate change is, as you know, an existential threat. If we would just focus on what's important, there is a very valid argument that if we don't get these questions right, then all the other questions doesn't matter. So, on, so even though we're going with pertinent and we have 10 constellations, there is a very good reason that we try to get these questions in this constellation very right. And this is the last chance. This is the last time we go into the sustainability constellation to get the questions. So I hope we're going to really come together with some good questions this time. And we do have a fantastic input speaker that we're very happy to have here, Julia Steinberger, that you're going to be introduced to in a second. But for now, let's get up to the sustainability constellation. Let's go. First, go to ysiplenary.org and click the night sky. This is the questions fair, where each star is a question, and each group of stars, or constellation, contains questions within a particular topic. You can find questions fair sessions in the schedule in the left sidebar and join them from there. Just enter the session and join the Zoom. As you listen to the speaker motivate their questions, Think about which questions you believe to be pertinent for YSI. While the speaker talks, suggest your questions to your peers by entering them into the panel. This is not a Q&A. The questions are suggestions for research in YSI, not a question for the speaker to answer. Take a look at all the questions that were suggested and like the ones that you think are best. The questions moderator will select the most liked questions and present them to the speaker for a comment. These questions will be added to the constellation where they can be further refined. Refine the questions by finding the best exact phrasing. Suggest a rephrasing yourself or like the rephrasings that you think are good. After the session is over, you can find the submitted questions in the constellations. As a plenary participant, you can mark your 10 favorite questions in the graph. Just click the star in the corner of the questions card and they will be added to your YSI profile. The most popular questions will make it into the final list. Sustainability, sustainability, you fill me with the limit of our industry and is it an infinity? If you like driving and you're trying to go far, you should probably be familiar with the brakes on your car or you'll break it apart. Yep, you properly wreck it, whether it's a colossal fossil hog or conscious electric. Check it. Why is economics not ecologics? The science of the earth and the living that we eat on it. Since making a living and living things are two concepts entwined, should economists all be ecologists? Mm. But that's not probable if 
Our society's not sure if the earth is an offered gift or just an inert sprawl of dirt that we're to profit with. And that's not economics, that's philosophical shit. Or is it? Cause dig it, what quantifies value? And is it a subjective or an objective attribute? Value is arguably that which you have in you. And it must include that if it starts to be valid truth, that in the planet too. So what makes the table full? Whether the market is bare or a raging bull. Whether we share or just one small part take the whole. What good is growth if it isn't sustainable? Sustainable. Sustainability, sustainability, how big to be sustainability, sustainability. I love those drafts. Uh, hi, I'm Brennan, and uh, welcome everyone. I want to invite you all to uh, read through the existing questions. We'll be turning momentarily to uh, Julia Steinberger. And uh, meantime, I just want to remind you that during the talk, you are encouraged to submit your questions, to reflect on, and to consider. Um, just quickly to reiterate, uh, in the graph, you can see questions already submitted, which Julia will be discussing. and. Uh, if you're able to submit additional questions um, and they uh, get uh, a number of likes, we'll also be uh, sending the, those to uh, Julia to reflect on. Uh, speakers may or may not uh, have time uh, to reflect on all the liked questions, but I encourage you to go ahead and put those in if you have one that you really want uh, Julia to reflect on. Um, if it uh, garners likes, uh, that may well occur uh, in the session. And uh, we will return to your questions after Julia has finished. Now, uh, I will turn to our session moderator, who will be uh, introducing our speaker this morning. Hi, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Rosie Collington and I'm one of the coordinators of the Economics of Innovation Working Group. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Julia Steinberger, who researches and teaches in the interdisciplinary areas of ecological economics and industrial ecology. Um, now, her research examines the connections between resource use and societal performance. She's interested in quantifying the current and historical linkages between resource use and socioeconomic parameters and identifying alternative development pathways to guide the necessary transition to a low carbon society. Um, she's the recipient of a Leverholm Research Leadership Award for her research project, Living Well Within Limits, um, which investigates how universal human well-being might be achieved with, within planetary boundaries. She's, she is lead author for the IPCC's sixth assessment report with Working Group 3. Um, before coming to the University of Leeds in 2011, Professor Steinberger was a senior researcher at the Institute of Social Ecology in Vienna, um, where she investigated sustainable cities and the links between material use and economic performance. Um, over to you, Julia. Thanks so much, Rosie and everybody, and I'm extremely impressed with the your entire organization and setup here. This is uh, truly impressive. So uh, very well done. Um, so I want to tell you a bit about my questions. Um, uh, I should say that I'm now at the University of Lausanne since the summer, but that's quite a recent move. And um, uh, I also decided that inspiring, I, when I was first asked to pr provide questions, the word inspiring was used and I decided that I didn't like that very much either. So I've decided to call it vital. And uh, I probably would agree that sustainability is the most important point, but let's see. I didn't realize, I also didn't realize it was competitive contest. There's nothing to get economists going quite like competition. So um, in terms of the things I want to talk about a bit, um, I want to give you a bit of context. So I'm also somebody who's uh, aware of or adjacent to the climate science. I'm a social scientist in the domain of climate change. Uh, I'll talk about my suggestions for three important questions. And one of the directions like 
that where we made some progress. Um, so that's what I would like to talk about. So the climate context, this is a picture of Vizubi in France, which is actually not incredibly far from where I am right now, especially considering that some of you are around the world. And here you see infrastructure being destroyed by um, just incredible flooding, uh, tons of rocks and dirt and mud just sort of ramming rampage through this village. And these are the kinds of things that happen more and more all around the world. So uh, I just want to go from basics and uh, please don't be offended by this. So what are the physical causes of global warming? Um, the ones we all know about or should know about, they tend to be um, emissions of greenhouse gases of which carbon dioxide is the most important, but not the only one. There's also methane and nitrous oxides. And um, there's another big category of causes of climate change, um, uh, which are deforestation and changes in land use in general. And we tend not to talk about those as much, but they're actually uh, very, very important. Um, although they also, they're also a bit harder to measure and have higher uncertainty. Um, and 100% is from human activity. So that debate is settled and uh, I will not be entertaining questions about this and neither should you. Um, the other components we see as well now is we see natural feedback loops that are driven by human activity, um, which is uh, extra bad news, right? Because we, can't con we can control our own activity we can't necessarily control the feedback loops put into play by our own activity. Um, and those would include things like the dieback of the Amazonian forest or, or things like that, which cause climate change, but are also the result of climate change. Um, so now to the to point of economics. So what economic activities are the causes of these emissions and land use change? And, um, you know, so there's burning fossil fuels, right? and petrol, coal, and gas. And what do we burn them for? We burn them for electricity, for transport, a lot, for heating, for industry. So that's already a lot of different economic sectors right there. Um, and in terms of the other emissions, and uh, it's from livestock, um, dairy, poultry, et cetera. A lot of it is from uh, palm oil, which is uh, half of palm oil production is used in biodiesel. And we have explicit policies in Europe calling for the use of biodiesel in cars. And at the same time, we're driving deforestation across the world in Indonesia. Uh, so nutrition and transport again. So transport sits in a lot of these. And then we have cement buildings and infrastructure, um, which is an another category of emissions of CO2. And so basically um, the answer in terms of what economic activities are the cause of emissions uh, uh, and land use change or the causes of global warming, the easier question is to answer what, uh, which aren't um, very few. So basically, a lot of everything that we do in the economy causes climate change. Um, we have an emergency on our hand. And so what I'd like to just tell you a little bit about is the scientific basis of that emergency. So the IPCC uh, put together a report on 1.5 degrees. And the reason they did that is because the Paris Agreement that a lot of countries are committed to and the US will soon be committed to again, um, go between, uh, asks countries to stay below two degrees and aim for 1.5 if possible. So it's typical UN um, double goal, to make everybody happy, but you're not really sure what you're talking about. Um, and so one of the things that happened as a result of signing the Paris Agreement is governments didn't even know what it meant. Like is two degrees that much worse than 1.5 degrees or not? Or what are we committing to here? So they asked for this report and I'm just gonna go over some of the results um, from the report. So. The first thing to point out is we are already uh, at one degree of uh, warming. So that's, um, we're already closer to the 1.5 side of things than we are to the zero, that's for sure. In terms of impacts, um, I'm just sort of going through different categories of impacts, but the whole 1.5 degree report is full of these and really looked at the difference between 1.5 and two. Uh, so deadly heat waves uh, occurring at least once every five years would affect 14% of the global population at 1.5 or 37% of the population at two degrees, which means that two degrees is 2.6 times worse than 1.5. Uh, Arctic free of summer ice, um, 10 times worse. Insect species losing 50% of their range, three times worse. Uh, when they lose th that much of their range, by the way, they're at risk of going extinct. And if you look at two degrees, we're already at risk, uh, we're already putting about a fifth of global insect populations at risk. That's extraordinarily worrying because um, basically a lot of our, the, the web of life and our food chains and everything depends on insects. They're really important. 
uh, dying coral reefs. Um, we lose somewhere between 70 and 90% of coral reefs at 1.5 degrees. We lose all of them at two. So you can see that uh, the differences are really stark. We're in a very strongly nonlinear system where the responses, to the extent that we can estimate them, it, you know, it's not like three degrees is tw twice as bad as 1.5 degrees. This is not at all how it works. We're in a very, very, um, um, we're in interfering with complex systems, strongly nonlinear, and every single fraction of degree that we can avoid is gonna make a huge difference. And that's already very clear. So that brings us to which temperature are we hitting for? And um, this is sort of a collection of headlines from the last couple of years. In 2018, brutal news, uh, global carbon emissions jumped to all time high. Um, last year, they, raised, they rose again. Uh, this year, they're not gonna rise, but only because of coronavirus. It's expected that once we get rid of coronavirus, things will rebound and uh, go back on track, especially because a lot of the governments have been using the coronavirus stimulus to stimulate and keep in business fossil fuel companies, airlines, and so on, um, including Exxon, uh, which, and we've learned that Exxon, um, one of the large petroleum companies, uh, one of the largest, uh, has planned for surging carbon emissions, as it, according to their leaked documents. And all this brings us to uh, the fact that we're not at all heading for 1.5 or even two degrees. So even under the optimistic scenario whereby the country's commitments under the Paris Agreement are put into play, we're he still heading for more than three degrees within the century. Um, and that's optimistic because who knows if they're going to be successful. Now, the reason I wanted to talk about all this is because this is a very worrying trajectory. It's, it's, it's devastating, it's very frightening. And the question is, who could have known about it? And the answer to who could have known about it is, ta-da, as some of you might know. I oh, know, sorry, I still wanted to talk about this, right? Excuse me, I was getting ahead of myself. Um, so I just wanna put where we're going in context as to where we came from. And I think this is super interesting because I did not, there's a reason I'm telling you about this is because I did not know about it as a physicist. I expect you don't know it as economists. We don't, we're, we don't have a lot of literacy about the history of the earth and the history of temperature and changes in life forms and all of that stuff. But I think it's really important to understand where we as a species and a planet come from. So in this graph, um, uh, one of the, th it basically shows time is going backwards uh, to the left. And then forwards, you can see different types of uh, emission and uh, temperature ranges. So there's a sort of purple, blue, and um, pink bands to the right. And uh, temperatures on the vertical axis. And zero is what we call the pre-industrial average. So it's before we started burning fossil fuels. Now, what's really important, and then if you go, uh, um, uh, the present time is sort of shown as a little red dot, basically, it's around 2005, that's close enough to where we are now. And what you can see is that we've come from this little stretch uh, where I put agriculture and civilization, this little stretch of sort of narrow band of zero temperatures around zero, that's where we developed agriculture and civilization. That's where we developed all the food we eat, writing, cities, everything. So we as a species, everything cool and interesting that we did happened in that sort of narrow temperature range and in the last 12,000 years, which are, as you can tell, the years since the last ice age. So you can see that before the sort of uh, straight flat bit, you sort of go down and dip down and there's sort of successive ice ages. And that's uh, during those sort of successive ice ages is when Homo sapiens was born, right? Homo sapiens only exists for the past 250 or so thousand years. And Homo genus only exists for the past sort of 3 million years. So we as a species, I've never really known very warm temperatures. That's one of the things to realize. We've sort of been in ice ages, which are kind of terrible and almost drove us extinct. Um, and in this sort of nice little Holocene era, which is the time when we did everything, including economics and having thriving economies. And when we warm the planet, we're actually going, we're actually pushing the planet into a state in the far distant past. And in fact, in a past that our species has never known. And um, by, 2150, which is not so far from now in terms of history. Uh, so in a sort of 120 years, we could have pushed the planet back 50 million years in terms of its climate, in terms of its past climate. And at that level, it's not clear, uh, you know, it's not clear that human civilization can survive and a lot of people believe it can't. 
uh, because we just don't have the stability to grow our crops. It's not possible for ecosystems and species to adapt to change that is so rapid and massive. So we're, we're really facing a lot of uh, problems and um, a really devastating trajectory unless we change a lot of things very fast. So now uh, this graph is just to confirm that we have now left the Holocene. So this little narrow band of stable temperatures around zero, that's shown in pink in this graph. It's from the last IPCC report. And you can see that we have now basically since 2015 or some, something around there left the Holocene. We are no longer in that clement kind of warm compared to the, holo uh, to the ice ages zone where we were able to develop stable things like agriculture, cities, et cetera. So we're facing a very uncertain future and we're on a very devastatingly rapid trajectory of climate change. And the question is who could have known it? And the answer is the fossil fuel companies. So this is a graph developed in the early 1980s by Exxon. It's been made famous by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who presented it in Congress and confronted the scientists of Exxon with that graph. But, uh, and basically they confirmed, they knew, they were, they, they knew roughly the carbon concentration and the temperature curve is devastatingly accurate. Um, and so these companies knew internally already four decades ago, what kind of future they were pushing us into. And that really makes you think about, okay, what are we doing in our economy when we have such powerful, profitable actors that are pushing us into this direction? How do we change our economies? How do we do things differently? And uh, yeah, so it's in a memo from 1982. And so this brings me to my three questions. So how can economics help us face and deal with this most dangerous time in human history? And that's what I'm trying to get at with these questions. So um, I'll be going through the three questions in order. So I'll just, uh, skip this. Um, so the first one, uh, the mo my motivation for it is that our current economy drives destruction. So we really have to think about quite deeply about what our current economy, economic setup is doing. And we have to understand that a lot better, a lot better than current economic thought has allowed us to do that. So the question here is how can economic insights help us understand indus the industrial and technical forces pushing us into climate breakdown? And so some people would call that the dynamics of capitalism. I might do that. Some people might call that growth. Some people might call that fossil fuel industries and their, their in the, the technological complex surrounding them. But whatever, however you choose to sort of frame that, you kind of, we kind of have to come to grips with why those things are pushing us into the direction that they currently are. So we need a clear, realistic understanding of economic forces we are up against and how they operate because so that uh, we can expose them for what they are. And here I would really recommend the work of Naomi Oreskes, Eric Zara Conway, who wrote Merchants of Doubt. It's also a fantastic documentary movie. Jeffrey Sopran, who's uh, working with Naomi Oreskes right now, uncovering amazing, troubling stuff about Exxon and fossil fuel companies and their links to our governments. Uh, Lee Stokes in the US is doing a lot of work on utility companies and how they operate, which is not necessarily market friendly, if you think about markets as good things. And uh, I also really recommend uh, looking into Amy Westerbelt's work. She runs this Drilled podcast, and she is really doing great economic journalism in the sense of exploring where these long trends come from in our history. Like they're associated with the rise of things like the public relations industry, advertisement, um, the manipulation of the consumer, uh, so, so I think it's really important to sort of have a deep understanding of these specific industries and their interrelations with our economy and our governments. Um, the other reason it's really important to answer this question is because so we can strategize to counter and destroy these destructive forces. We have to, the, the survival of humanity and human civilization is simply incompatible with the survival of the fossil fuel industry. Um, that's my personal opinion, but I don't think it's a very original one. Um, and I would just recommend think, uh, following uh, and reading some of the people who've been thinking about this. Uh, so Joanna Bozua and Carla Scandier uh, have been working with the Next System uh, think tank. And Kate Aronoff uh, is a fantastic reporter on fossil fuel industry. And they've been thinking a lot on things like nationalization. Like, can you nationalize this industry in order to ramp it down? What does it take what powers do we give ourselves in order to ramp down these industries? And the other thing we have to do is we have to build something new, which is not so dangerous. So it's quite important to understand where our previous setup went wrong 
in order that our new setup is less harmful and avoid some of these pitfalls. And I think that a renewable, you know, everybody says renewable technologies are great. Well, they're not always great, especially in the ways that they're extracted, deployed. Um, they can be quite devastating to people and there are ways of doing it better and doing it worse. And so it's quite important to look at not just technologies per se, but also ideas around um, energy democracy and how to, to make those things happen better. Um, so my second question, the motivation for it is around new economics for a new era, which is aligned with political movements. So I think that the we're now understanding that markets don't act by themselves, that they don't have uh, their own laws or logic. They have the, they're, they're sort of the law of the jungle. It's whoever's the strongest dominates the market is able to push things their way. So if we want to change things, we have to build a new economics. And um, the, the, the things that are really changing um, uh, facts on the ground and momentum on the ground are political movements. So being overtly political is really important here. And I think Kate Aronoff, that I mentioned on the previous slide, she says it quite well. She said, political movements are market signals. This is how we tell the market what to do. And this is how we bring the market into the realm of democracy. So my question here is how can alternative economics bolter polit new politics and movements aiming to counter planetary breakdown? And the fact is that political movements like the Sunrise Movement, the climate strikes, uh, or Fridays for Future, regardless of what you call them, Extinction Rebellion, uh, which is very important uh, in the UK and uh, in the rest of in mainland Europe and some countries, all of these need are in great need of alternative economic proposals. So people are really hungry to try to understand what an alternative economics would look like. And the economics profession has not been really great at um, engaging with them and answering their questions and coming up with proposals that they can take forward. And I think this is a huge missed opportunity. So I would try to encourage uh, you, me, us, all of us to come up with alternative macro visions and models. So I think that the really important thing to get right here is not the micro, like, am I quantifying cost benefit right? That's not where this is at. We're way past, we're, we're so far past anything that resembles equilibrium. Um, that we just, we just need sort of something to head for and some basic principles and to try to go in that direction. Because anybody who tells you that they can optimize what's going to be coming into the future is lying. That's already very clear. But uh, I think that some of these macro visions and models sort of exist, but it's a question of giving them more economic uh, basis and reality. So around the Green New Deal, uh, I think degrowth has really interesting ideas because we need to specifically degrow sectors. Whether or not you believe we need to degrow the whole economy, we need to degrow certain types of consumption, we need to degrow certain sectors, certain technologies. How do we do that? Um, one uh, uh, piece of research I think is really interesting that just came out um, this year is uh, Simone D'Alessandro and his team in Pisa have been working on this Eurogreen project. And I think that that's something, if you haven't seen it before, I'd really encourage you to go and have a look at it. They've been coming up with some really um, interesting examples of ways to do things differently and explore these kinds of policy frameworks. And I think we need to, to be able to discuss transformative along the lines of Green New Deal policy proposals in the context of alternative economic forms. So we shouldn't say we're gonna change our policy and not change our economics. We need the economics that will go with those policies and accompany them and give them the grounds of experimentation and potential for success they deserve. A lot of these policy proposals cannot succeed in um, if we just keep capitalism running the way it is. So we need alternative ideas. And here I would really recommend uh, that you look at the Next System Project in Alternative Economics, uh, which is a book um, of a collection of chapters, essays of really original thinkers. So if you're, if you're not sure what that looks like, this is a great example. And it just came out, I think, last, in the last week or a couple of weeks. Um, if you're interested in degrowth, we have a great growth in degrowth books or growth, great growth and great degrowth books. So I really recommend these. They came out um, all in the last few months. And uh, um, I just recommend that you look at it. And I, also because as you can see, for instance, in the last one, degrowth in movements, the degrowth uh, side of economics has always tried to, to be close to the activist side and to sort of keep that, those lines of communication open. So that can also be an example, regardless of whether or not you um, agree with specific proposals from the degrowth camp. And uh, I just wanted to, again, plug this. I think this is really gonna be a huge resource. Um, uh, the New Systems uh, Reader Alternatives to a Failed Economy. 
All right, and my third motivation is around mainstreaming economic literacy for transformation. And the reason I'm motivated here is that I think this is really important is I think people get paralyzed by economics being a speciality. They feel that they can't speak to policymakers or to politicians or to journalists because um, they don't know enough about what economics is about or could be about. So they, there's, they're kind of silenced by the current technocratic, um, very intense, uh, intertwinement of mainstream economics and policymaking that shuts out a lot of people. And so I think if we want to, if we want to really transform our systems, one of the things we have to do is we basically have to be part of making alternative economic ideas mainstream and trying to tell people to be comfortable to engage in these topics. And so my question here is which economics education around social, political, degrowth, et cetera, can enable a complete and urgent metamorphosis of our societies. And I don't mean education just like in classrooms and universities. I mean mainstreaming debate and education through uh, media, newspapers, uh, the kinds of communication you guys are, are, are and girls and whoever um, are engaging in now. So this is just something that I would uh, like to encourage you to think about. And my, my point here is that I think we need to communicate real knowledge about the economy to counter simplistic neoclassical narratives, you know, around the, the immutable law of supply and demand curves and optimal prices, uh, that the market is the legitimate area for all social decision making, and that we just have to put up with whatever the market decides it's doing. And we really need to offer a new basis forward. Um, I would say that here we have a, a great importance for alternative uh, well-being visions of the economy. So it, visions of the economy that move away from growth for tons of good reasons, but really focus on the things that we need to be to live well. Uh, Kate Rareth and her contribution on donut economics, I think is very important. Uh, there's also the Wellbeing Economics Alliance. If you haven't looked at their work, I really support you in doing that because they are engaging directly with the national governments. There are already several governments that are part of this Wellbeing Economics Alliance and more sort of on the waiting list or in the, the process of discussing it with them. Uh, including New Zealand, Iceland, Scotland, Costa Rica, I believe. And one of the things that's been really interesting with the corona crisis is that the governments that were already, where, whose civil service was already engaged in discussion with the Wellbeing Economics Alliance, um, were much more receptive to effective measures on coronavirus that were also not economically damaging. So they really were ready to put public health first and deal with the, the virus sort of um, uh, in an early and effective fashion rather than sort of letting it run because they didn't want to uh, shut down the economy. And I think we need to transform economic contents and perceptions uh, for anywhere from schools to public authorities to media. And um, I think that here people like David Graeber, Jason Hickel, or Thomas Piketty are all very important. Um, there's the importance of bringing up economics into the sphere of democratic decision making. And uh, here, I can't even read my slide anymore, but hopefully I said something sensible. So we'll move on to the next one. Uh, I think I just have a few minutes. I wanted to show you some of what uh, this looks like in my own research. So within this Living Well Within Limits project, and the fact that I couldn't really do it um, because energy use, I just wanted to study, that's what's what I always wanted to study, the energy use and climate implications in their relationship to well-being. And the problem here was that uh, economics was the monkey in the middle, where if you've ever played monkey in the middle, you know that if you're small like me and you have two older brothers, you don't really get the ball very much. And in this case, the, 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 the economics or mainstream economics is an 800 pound gorilla who can sit wherever they want. And in this case, they really dominate the, any kind of debate you wanna have between environment and society, economics positions itself in the middle. And one of the problems with that is you have allowed questions that correspond to that division, uh, like what are the energy requirements of human activity, uh, of economic activity, and what are the economic requirements of human well-being? You have allowed answers that are around decoupling efficiency, around uh, infinite wants and desires. I mean, and because you're really limited by having these neoclassical lenses of green growth and utility theory, and you're allowed to still have niggling doubts about evidence, about contradictions, and you can even write papers on that, you can even get published, but you can't ever explore the systemic uh, topic you want to explore. 
And so, and one of the things I had to do in order to do this Living Well Within Limits project is I basically had to create stepping stones around economics. And uh, one of the key aspects of that was to try to find an alternative, basically really formalize what I meant by well-being, which has to do with human needs and their satisfiers. Uh, that gives you really a different basis from utility theory and a much more um, concrete one. And I think one that's much more amenable to, to robust research, but also one of the key aspects was provisioning systems and heterodox economics and th that kind of view of supply chains. And so that's one of the things I just like to encourage you to do is to think about provisioning systems. And I'm gonna race through slides because I wanna finish quite soon. So there's stuff we're not going to look at. That's the perspective from our whole project. Provisioning systems sit in the middle. They're both physical and social and we kind of study them together, which is very important to us. And um, we looked at the political economy of car dependence. I'm not going to talk about that, but it is a provisioning systems approach. So I'm going to skip, I'm sorry I'm doing this. It's just, I wanted to get to the questions and discussion. And we're still skipping here. Right, I wanted to show you this one um, because I think it's quite important. We looked at privatization uh, and the provisioning system approach means that we have to schematically, we have to study the agents, uh, structures and relations around the system of provision of privatized in this case, it was electricity, water, and public transportation provision in the UK. And um, one of the things you can hopefully see is that you can see who the, who the agents are, the providers, private, their, their financial backers, uh, consumers, and the state in the middle. And we could sort of study processes and narratives that were done, you know, privatization is justified by private efficiency. There's a justification for deregulation at the state level around market competition. And you sort of have the, the very strong representation of the consumer as homo economicus, uh, rational decision maker. And when we do a systems of provision analysis, we actually uncover a very different reality. And I think that that's really important, this idea of exposing our economic system for what it is rather than what it wants to look like, um, where basically we're finding uh, motivations and facts of rent extraction on the private side, on the provider side. Um, we see that the government is extremely vulnerable to uh, private sector lobby lobbying and um, imposes a, a market ideology on its own decision making, and uh, that the consumers are punished by inequality, cost increases, and various forms of uh, market-based deprivation. So I think that that's one of the, just to give you sort of an example of what the different ways you can see what the economy is doing, depending on whether or not you take a political economy or a more realistic approach to, to studying what's going on. And um, I think I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, we wrote about this. We got attacked by the UK government. It was quite interesting. So there you go. I, will, I, I, I don't want to talk anymore. Thank you so much, Julia. That was such an interesting presentation. I, f I found the, the, the last bit particularly interesting and I'm gonna look up your paper afterwards. Um, I'm also very interested in this relationship between um, uh, sustainability and, and what it means for well-being and how we live and your presentation has reminded me a bit of a book I read recently by Kate Soper on um, post-growth living um, yeah yeah but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ask you my questions I'm going to turn to the audience now and feed you some questions that we've had in um, so the first one is um, climate change is characterized by non-linear and complex processes that cannot currently be fully modeled suggesting the potential of unanticipated step changes mm -hmm. given the dire consequences of error what if any approaches to risk modeling are appropriate in this context so i think that this is something where we uh this is um a completely accurate characterization of climate change um, and global warming. And the, so I think that one of the perspectives we have to take here is a precautionary perspective. So we have to think about the consumption and the human activities that are necessary to maintain uh, and protect, preserve human well being uh, and human function and societal function. And we have to keep those well within the limits that we think exist uh, for. Um, for dangerous climate change. And that means for me, that it's very clear that the, the best and easiest way to do that is to reduce consumption. And that's not in question anywhere. So the easiest way to mitigate and reduce emissions is still simply to reduce and get rid of excessive uh, consumption. 
And, uh, and that's something that nobody in policymaking and nobody in economics is really willing to talk about. And I think we really do need to start talking about that. So the way we stay safe is by doing more than we think we need to do in a way that's safe, in a way that protects people. But it's certainly not trying to make it up to the edge. I mean, recently in the UK, there was this great example, you know, uh, the, the UK government said we need to reach zero emissions by 2050. And a coal mine was approved in Cumbria in the north of England that will operate until 2049 and then shall close their doors. It's like, that's, that's not reality. This is not the precautionary principle. This is not how any of this works. So we need to stop now as much as we possibly can. And then as we learn about the system, hopefully we'll get safer. So it's definitely a case of um, doing more to be much safer. Great, thank you, Julia. Um, okay, the second question we have in is, how will climate change impact food and water security over the coming decades? So th that's a great question. And I don't know the answer to those exactly, but what I suggest is that you, um, there are two special reports. So everybody knows about the special report on 1.5 degrees. There are two special uh, reports. I think there were three of them in total, um, but there are uh, two of them specifically. Uh, one is on land. So there was a special report that came out on land and the biosphere. And there was another one that came out on, the, on water and oceans. So if you look in those two, you'll find some of the answers uh, that you're looking for. I think one of the other things we're seeing is that since we're already at one degree, since we're already outside of the Holocene and our or, you know, even the, even the geological time we were in just 10 years ago, we're actually seeing these play out in real time. So we're seeing climate impacts have devastating effects on, for instance, um, I think it was uh, recent flooding that destroyed a quarter of the rice crop in Nigeria. So huge impact. Uh, but, you know, so we're seeing unprecedented flooding, unprecedented um, um, impacts on both agriculture and water. So we're already seeing those play out. So that's one of the other things to look for in those IPCC reports is the evidence that exists currently on our current trends and how the, that will, will develop. Thank you. Um, the next question that we have um, asks, can alternative business models and sectoral standards have a significant impact on climate mitigation? Absolutely. So I think one of the, you know, we have sustainable business models, maybe, but we certainly have very unsustainable ones. And um, one of the examples of that, one of the clearest examples of that is the automotive industry. So if you look at cars globally, just like internal combustion engine cars and their, their uh, emissions over the, I forget, I don't have the slide in front of me, so I forget if it's the past decade or so, they, their emissions have actually gone down compared to where they were. But emissions related to SUV have gone SUVs have gone up tremendously. So you, you have a sector whose main business model is to sell these vehicles that they make higher profit margins on, which is why they're advertising them all the time. So for every SUV sold, the automotive industry makes more money than for every normal car. That's why they're pushing them. It's not, it has nothing to do with consumer demand. The consumer demand exists because they're pushing them onto the market, right? Through advertising and so on. And, uh, and that's having a huge influence on global emissions. So I think if SUVs were a country, they would be something like the, the fifth largest emitting country in the world or something absolutely insane. So we have unsustainability trends, Never mind sustainable business models or alternatives that might come to fruition. Right now, some of the major industries on our planet are moving exactly in the wrong direction. It's the same for food, for instance, um, with ever more deforestation, ever more meat consumption. So we have these trends towards unsustainability. And I think we need to pay, start paying a lot more attention to that, which is when we see those, what are the tools we have to counter them? Do we have any understanding or um, any aspects of our economic understanding that can really help us stop those trends? Because the first, yeah, the first guidance should always be do no harm. And we're some of the major industrial players in our current economies are racing off a cliff edge, going exactly in the wrong direction. 
Okay, we have one more question, and then if no more come in, I'm going to steal the microphone for my own question. Um, so this fourth one is, in the context of global disaster, COVID-19 has demonstrated that we cannot depend on seamless coordination across, across nations, institutions, and industries. Can economic research support improved global coordination across systems in anticipation of future climate disaster? I think the answer is clearly yes. I'm not as much of an expert on international cooperation um, or, but as I was saying, having simply economies that have this idea of the well-being economy of putting public health and um, you know the, the benefit of the public and its citizens front and center, that can already make such a big difference in terms of the coronavirus response. So in the case of a pandemic, when governments don't even really know what's coming at them. So the idea that our current economies aren't able to do something, some economies were, and, and are also much better at learning from each other and staying within the WHO and working together across these international institutions, as opposed to demonizing the international institutions for pointing out that their responses are insufficient. So I think, and I think that there's also a lot of, that citizens can do in that perspective in terms of protecting the people within the governments that are making the links with these institutions. Because both in the UK and the US, uh, you know, researchers, scientists were demonized, attacked, uh, have death threats and so on. And I think it's really incumbent upon us, not just as economists, but also as citizens to really protect those people and their links to um, international organizations and international communication. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a final question, which is around the Green New Deal. Um, so I, I'm from Bridgewater in Somerset, which is not famous for much, but it's home to Europe's biggest uh, construction site. It's where Hinkley Point C is based. Um, so Bridgewater is, and for anyone who doesn't know, Hinkley Point C is, is a, a nuclear power station. Um, it's, it's always in the news at the moment. Um, but so uh, Bridgewater is like a formal, formal industrial town, uh, like a lot of the places where um, extractive energy industries uh, currently are based. Um, so I'm interested in First of all, how do we ensure that the Green New Deal supports places, um, you know, within this, this existing system as we transition to a new system? How do we ensure that the Green New Deal um, uh, is also providing jobs and repla replacing the kind of infrastructures um, in areas that depend on extractive industries? Um, and then secondly, I guess, what comes after the Green New Deal? So, and I think that this is, that's a really important question. And I think it's, um, it, it has to do with bringing economics into the sphere of democracy so that we're not uh, at the mercy of some kind of a, something that justifies itself as rational, rationalistic or optimizing, but is really just uh, profit accumulating for some people, maybe not so much for others. I think the, I think the Green New Deal and a lot of its incarnations have, pays a lot of attention to uh, frontline communities, which I think is a really interesting category because it actually includes both the people in, uh, who are affected, for instance, now by pollution. So frontline community could be somebody in a very polluted neighborhood next to a refinery, um, next to an industrial dump site, or even in a, in a city neighborhood that has a lot of air pollution from car traffic. So that, that would be a frontline community because they are negatively affected by the current industrial process. But frontline is also people who are engaged in working in industries uh, like the fossil fuel industry or um, extractive industries that are called upon to change in order to allow sustainability to happen. And so they are also going to be affected. And I think that one of the things the Green New Deal realizes is that we want this really fast, we need this really fast um, radical transformation of our economic production consumption systems across the world. But that's going to be traumatic or not traumatic, but it's gonna be a big deal. It's not gonna happen so easily. And you need you really need to provide um, options for people. You need to provide support systems, you need to provide training, and you need to really engage people so that they feel that they know they're part of it and that the plans are happening with their engagement. So you can't just have a plan that's imposed from on high and like, hey, we thought, we, we figured out what's best for you and you just cope now. It all, a lot of it has to do with the part, participation, 
and, and really the processes of economic democracy where you bring on board people and say, okay, well, this is our reality. This is, you know, we don't have a million choices here. We can't continue as we used to, for instance. That's not in the cards, but how do we go forward together? And that makes a huge difference. And I think that that's also something that uh, Ketan Joshi that I mentioned was talking about when he talked about uh, energy democracy. A transformation process can be um, experienced really negatively or really positively, depending on the amount of engagement and decision making and understanding that people have around it. And I think that that's something to, that we build as a social process. So economic processes have to be understood as social processes. And this transformation is not going to succeed if we don't really take that on board. So I think that that's, uh, that's maybe one, one way of putting it. Thank you. That's really interesting. I've, I've enjoyed this discussion a lot and I'm sure everyone who has logged into the Zoom to join us and on the live stream as well um, has similarly enjoyed. So thank you, Julia. Um, I, I'm sure everyone will continue following your work here at YSI. Um, and for everyone else, uh, this session isn't over yet. And please make sure you do check out the um, sessions that we have running over the, the weekend and into next week when we'll be trying to wrap up and make sense of uh, the questions that we've been asking and, and the people that we've been hearing from over the past week within the working groups. Um, but for now, we're heading back to the studio. So uh, thanks again, Julia. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very inspiring input talk. And it is for sure a super challenging situation that we're in. So this is the right time to come together. I saw that a lot of questions was already suggested over in the constellation, the sustainability constellation. If you're watching on the stream and you want to engage, now's the time to make, make it over there to help participate. I think we can get some really great questions. It's our last chance to get some good questions into the sustainability constellation. So this session is not over yet. We had an inspiring input talk, but now we need to do the actual work. So I'm going to send you back to Brennan, who will will lead that process. Hi all. As Thomas was saying, this is uh, an extraordinarily important uh, set of questions and uh, I, I would say meets the criterion of pertinence soundly. Uh, we had actually a lot of questions come in and new likes come in towards the end of the session. So I'll, um, we have some work ahead of us. Starting with the first question uh, that was asked to Julia, uh, would invite anyone to uh, add any clarification uh, suggestions, rephrasing suggestions. That question again, climate change is characterized by nonlinear and complex processes that cannot currently be fully modeled, suggesting the potential of unanticipated step changes. Given the dire consequences of error, what, if any, approaches to risk modeling are appropriate in this context. Uh, please feel free at this time to go ahead and add any suggested rephrasings on that question. And turning now, I'll go ahead and just cue you on the next question we heard Julia address which is how does or, or will climate change impact food and water security over the next decades? Critical question, obviously, uh, Julia referred us to the two special reports from the UN. Uh, perhaps, we could get a rephrasing on that that is uh, fully grammatical and I think we 
boy, we have some new likes coming in. This is awesome, guys. Okay. Uh, next question that Julia addressed. In the context, forgive me, can alternative business models and sectoral standards have a significant impact on climate mitigation? very crisp. Um, any suggestions, obviously very welcome. And if folks have uh, a comment uh, uh, or feel there's something we need to go into further regarding a question, please feel free to raise your hand at this point. Um, it's really, this is a great time for uh, everybody to be involved and participate. So um, very happy to give the floor to others and please just put your hand up and um, it'll be yours. All right. That last question that Julia addressed We've got, in the context of global disaster, COVID-19 has demonstrated that we cannot depend on seamless coordination across nations, institutions, and industries. Can economic research support improved global coordination across systems in anticipation of future climate disaster? Now, clearly to me, there are a lot of research questions in there. Um, and I think Julia actually said something similar that it's, uh, in fact, not even merely an economic question, but also one for, uh, to engage with as citizens in protecting interinstitutional links and, and links across nations. Um, if there are rephrasings that you folks uh, are thinking of there that um, would help to perhaps narrow or otherwise strengthen that question, please go ahead and jump in with those. I see we have one. Uh, Forgive me, we have two uh, potential rephrasings. One being, how can we improve global coordination to mitigate climate change? And another being, does the research community need to take a greater responsibility to inform how global coordination may take place? Uh, feel free to shift around likes if that is your preference or leave your likes exactly where they are if they're in the right place. Obviously, whichever we, uh, is the most liked will be shifted, will be uh, taken forward. There are also some questions here that Julia did not get to, but that have garnered a large number of likes. Um, particularly in the last few minutes of the session that I want to point out to folks. Um, among these, forgive me, just turning here. Could economists and young scholars participate in the creation of a new economic model and implement it? as a cryptocurrency? Could a decentralized value system be resilient enough to withstand political and financial efforts to maintain status quo? Uh, this is a fascinating topic and one with which I'm personally quite familiar. Uh, the 
in blockchain space, um, I would suggest to the group that if you have ways to bring this away from uh, comment towards question, um, you know, I, it, perhaps those rephrasings would be worthwhile. Um, but that's also something that uh, folks can interpret subsequently. Yeah, seeing continued, another light came in on that, uh, those two questions. Um, which I uh, work together as a, a statement of potential. All right, I'm seeing that uh, the question regarding global coordination uh, has now shifted from uh, the original wording to simply how can we improve global coordination to mitigate climate change? Uh, took out that introductory sentence about the context of COVID-19, made that perhaps more crisp, it's great. And again, if anyone feels uh, they want to take the floor uh, to comment on a question or uh, consider a rephrasing in greater detail, please just raise your hand, let me know. Uh, this, is, this is a discussion. Um, obviously there are those who are, uh, might not have a strong internet connection or for whatever reasons be reluctant and that's fine. But uh, if you're uh, excited to talk about something uh, with regard to the rephrasings, please um, don't be shy. Okay, I see that the question, how does climate change impact food and water security over the next decades has uh, two potential rewrites, uh, both of which have the same number of likes as the original question. So we have a three-way tie there. Uh, one of those rewrites, how does climate change impact food and water security Forgive me, that's the original. How does climate change impact food and water security over the next decades being the one uh, original? And how will the consequences of climate change impact food crops and the fresh water supply over the next decades? And it looks like we now have a clear uh, winner in terms of rephrasing with five likes there, two more just came in. All right. I see some continued editing going on. That's great. 
folks shifting likes to your preferred phrasing. Uh, we now have some very clear uh, questions distilled from those original questions. I want to emphasize for folks whose questions uh, might have been edited that um, that's it is a critical contribution to start the ball rolling. And so if you put in uh, a question that was subsequently shifted a little bit or narrowed, um, it is somewhat tongue in cheek that I'm talking about a, a winner uh, rephrasing. Um, we are, this process doesn't work without the core work of that initial pertinent question building and then the group work of refinement. And so, you know, your initial question that starts that conversation is a tremendous contribution and um, critically important and a, a sort of uh, should not be uh, in, in any way lessened by uh, subsequent refinement. Okay, so we have a potential rephrase that came in on the cryptocurrency question uh, with just one like though at the moment, how do we open for more experimentation on new business models. And I lost it, excuse me. Uh, how do we open for more experimentation on new business models, societal arrangements, and social structures to improve a sustainable and equitable world? So this, um, expands the uh, content, perhaps uh, it certainly makes it broader uh, as a question or um, than the two questions originally. Uh, feel free to shift likes there or not. Uh, obviously it uh, no longer contains the uh, reference to uh, cryptocurrency and decentralized value systems, um, that specific uh, articulation may or may not be what you want to see included in that final question. Uh, so you, of course, you are the ones who decide. So go ahead and uh, shift or do not uh, your likes there as preferred. Let's see what else we have shifting around. All right, we're still, we still have, how can we improve global coordination to mitigate climate change? Excellent, uh, very clean rewrite of that initial question. And second from the top, how will the consequences of climate change impact food crops and fresh water supply over the next decades? Uh, looks like the uh, cryptocurrency question remains as it as it was originally written, including those references to cryptocurrency and decentralized value. <clears throat> yeah, great. Two new likes coming in there. Uh, the popular favorite remaining uh, the original articulation of the question. Let's 
see. Okay, so we're going to transition very shortly to uh, favoriting among these questions. This is where you can add uh, your stars from your finite uh, endowment of stars to particular questions that you feel are most pertinent to uh, advance economics, to advance scholarship, to advance, in this case, uh, to advance the species or, and, and or protect it. So I have just transitioned here to allowing favorites among these. Uh, that is to say, um, stars, please feel free as uh, you're looking at these to go ahead and identify those that you think um, really do offer um, pertinence for the field, for scholarship, for humanity. And recall that you can do this not only with the uh, questions that you all uh, just produced, but all and refined, but also with the questions that Julia Steinberger uh, gave us uh, all three of which she of course addressed in her talk just now. Right. I see folks are beginning to do just that. That's great. I see at least one of these just uh, favorited, if you will, with a star. Uh, I think we have far more than one highly pertinent question here. I encourage folks to, of course, there is the uh, temptation always to sort of hoard our favorites uh, till the end to keep those stars. Uh, but remember that you can always redistribute um, at least prior to um, the closing of this process, um, but certainly after uh, the session we're in now, you can always redistribute your likes, your rather favorites, um, so if you see one that you want to make sure doesn't get lost in the shuffle or uh, you're at least considering as uh, being one of the 10 most pertinent questions you've seen, I encourage you to uh, jump in there with your favorite, uh, your expression of that preference helps the entire group to see that, that question.
I saw in the chat, uh, Nicole and Mike mentioned that there's a little bit of a delay with favoriting the questions. Absolutely correct. Um, if you just click it once and then oh, just hang out for, you know, five seconds, uh, it, it will actually uh, manifest your, your preference there. Okay, so I see we are at time. So I'm gonna hand this back to the studio. Thank you so much for participating with me in uh, this follow-up. I think we, we did some great work and this has been Brennan O'Rear in the sustainability constellation back to the lighthouse now. Thank you, Brennan. We're actually not really in the lighthouse because now is the time to look at the whole graph. We were just inside the uh, sustainability constellation and now we've zoomed all the way out so we can see all the constellation and how the graph is taking shape. I personally enjoyed this session a lot. I think we really did progress on producing some questions that were extremely pertinent. And if you agree, you can go in and mark them in the graph as some of the most pertinent questions or like the, the questions that you uh, want as your favorite and that you might want to put on your YSI profile or engage in for future research projects in YSI. I definitely think we did a lot of progress. Uh, so here's the, the entire graph. You can see that it it, it is changing shape every time we speak. The constellations are pulling further apart. Uh, the sustainability constellation is down here. Uh, the, the questions uh, that we just discussed have been added into it. So maybe we want to zoom all the way into the sustainability constellation. There we go. And now you can see only the stars that were part of the main graph that are in the const sustainability constellation. The stars that are connected with lines are the stars that are taking that are currently among the top 100 and uh, you see that they're not as big as some of the other uh, stars in the other constellations uh, so if you think that sustainability is an extremely pertinent issue maybe now is the time to go in there but we can have a little bit of a look on the different questions that are inside the sustainability constellation and how they measure out uh, towards each other the most favorite question in the sustainability constellation is this one are economic growth and sustainability mutually exclusive? Well, I guess that's the million dollar question uh, because that will impact how we treat, we deal with these issues. Uh, the next question here is how can we learn to coexist with our environment? Uh, yeah, well, that may be like if we, if we take all the questions and we put them together and we have to generalize and be like, what, are, what, what, what questions are more fundamental than others? I think this is one of the questions that we would like get to at the bottom. How can we as a species learn to coexist with our environment? That's a, that's a really deep question. So I like that this has been voted up in the sustainability constellation. Uh, oh, and it's changing as we speak because someone is in their liking and this is, this is actually live. So if someone is favoriting as we speak, you can see that. Uh, Jeff Mann, who was speaking yesterday, suggested the third question, must economics generalize? Beyond the data, can economic Theory, can economics develop theories and or methods specific to time and place? This might be actually moved later on to another constellation, but Jeff was given his talk in the sustainability constellation, which is why it's placed here. And as we were talking, like it's switching around with some other uh, uh, questions, but we're only going to go into the top three. Uh, today will be the last day in, uh, with input talks in the questions fair. So there's two, two more left uh, for you to catch. Um, Stephanie Blankenburg is next and uh, make sure to catch that and uh, then we have all of weekend to place our favorites before uh, the questions fair ends on Sunday and then all the working groups are going to get into into the work with, of working with these questions. Okay, but uh, I'll see you for the next talk. <laughs>